Welcome into the KSO Show. I am Mason Voth, joined by Drew Galloway here on a Tuesday, ready to continue our week buildup to K-State Colorado, which I think one of the most important figures in that game, he's the most important figure in most games for K-State, but even more so coming out of this bye and considering the challenge that K-State's going to have to face and that the last time they were on the road in Big 12 play, they look lost, they look undisciplined, they need somebody to be able to kind of step up and Keep them steady is what I would say. We got to talk about Avery Johnson and how things look after five games, where the expectation is moving forward, and also more specifically, what's coming up here. And uh, just go over all the different things that have played out for him this year. Cause I think there have been some really good highs, there have been some really bad lows. And I think, I don't know how you feel about this, but it seems to me like a greater percentage of the fan base has had their opinion of Avery Johnson and their expectations shift down as opposed to those that have obviously had them go up, but even more so uh, people that have just kind of kept them where they are. Like for me, I don't know that my expectations for him have necessarily changed, and I think we continue to see him improve week by week and do different things. Uh, But I know for some people it's a totally different situation and and scenario. So uh, we'll get into to some of that today. But before we do that, I want to uh, remind people that if you are looking to watch Avery Johnson not in the United States, you're only going to get one chance in his career, at least I think. I, I don't anticipate any other uh, Euro- European games for Avery Johnson. Uh, and so there will be no better way to kick off the 2025 college football season than cheering on the K-State Wildcats in the Aer Lingus College Football Classic in Dublin, Ireland. The Cats will score off with the Iowa State Cyclones on August 23rd, 2025. Whether it's a quick trip to Dublin for the game, a multi-city adventure throughout the Irish countryside, or exploring the Emerald Isle on your own, there's a package for you. Visit Cats2Ireland.com. That's Cats, the number two, Ireland.com. All right, so that is uh, what we have there for you. And I want to start this quarterback conversation. We're going to go kind of all over the place for you today. Uh, with this. I got a lot of different thoughts and things I want to throw at you, Drew, and kind of get your opinion on. I'm going to start by giving you a a blind resume of two quarterbacks in college football. Oh boy. And yeah, you're gonna you're gonna get their numbers against FBS schools only. So I took out any games against FCS opponents. Um, both have played one game against an FCS opponent uh, and then the others have been against FBS teams. Mostly comparable games. So here, here is what you have in front of you. Uh, you have one quarterback on the left, one quarterback on the right. I'll give you a, a minute to digest all of those numbers and then uh, let you tell me what you think of them initially and which quarterback you would rather have. I mean, on the left, you have more touchdowns, one more interception, completion percentage is pretty much the same, yards pretty much the same. Uh, rushing is where I think that it really differentiates. You have 284 on one side and 128 on the other. Uh, rushing touchdowns is one more to the left and then fewer sacks. Uh, can I guess who the two quarterbacks are? Yes, I was, that was going to be my question. I'm going to have you – you can guess who they are. Avery Johnson is on the left. That is correct. And on the right – Ooh, can I can I get a conference on the right? Um, we'll get to conference. It's a, another power conference player. Um, oh, that both, really that really narrows it down. Both of these players are in their second year of college football, and this this might be the one to help you if you remember. Both of them played their bowl game in the same stadium last season. Ooh. Is on the right. Ooh, no. All right, you're gonna have to tell me who's on the right. Um, would it help if I said that one of his team, one of the guy on the right, his team was a part of one of the more notable upsets this past weekend? Is on is on the right, Jalen Milrow. No, not Jalen Milrow. Both of them, both of them are second year quarterbacks. Uh, you have the SEC correct. Uh, it is oh, Nico. All- it yeah, is Nico Iamaleava, the Tennessee quarterback, which got off to a blazing start. I think. I think if you asked a lot of people nationally or even 
even locally to some extent, they would probably say that they'd rather have Nico Iamaliava right now and based off how he's played this season. But if you look at what they've done, this is the last four games for both players because they started the season against FCS opponents. I wasn't going to count that because we know well, those FCS games are kind of crapshoots anyways, and there's such a big variety in the the type of team that you're going to play uh, in those FCS games, which right now might be a good time uh, for, for me to go take a, a check of the old FCS standings and see uh, how everything's going. Uh, UT Martin's struggling this year. They're they're three and three to get things underway. Well, Chat Chattanooga is probably worse than UT Martin though. Yeah, they, they're they are two and three, um, and their wins have been against Portland State and East Tennessee. Uh, so not great there. But this is what these players have done against Power Conference competition this year, or not even Power, power Conference, just FBS. Um, so Kent State is included for Nico. Tulane is included for Avery, but that's what you have in those games and what these quarterbacks have been able to do. I mean, in any way, are you surprised by seeing that Avery's numbers are, for the most part, better when you take the overall product than uh, Nico Iamaliava? It, it's not super surprising if you have really paid attention because, I, and I think that this is why you've talked about people kind of lowering their expectations on Avery Johnson and whatnot. That's like, he has been pretty solid. Like, I think that you could make the argument that the expectations might've been too high coming in and that everybody thought that he was going to light the world on fire. But you, you look at that and you look at how Avery and Nico are perceived and, and you'd think that Nico would be blowing him away. The, the reason that I never thought that it was Nico was, you know, Tennessee beats Kent State 71 to 0 and he only had one touchdown. That's pretty wild. Yeah, yeah, you go and look at some of those numbers and that's the other thing too is if you start to try and find comparisons or anything uh within that, you would realize that K-State and Tennessee are kind of playing in similar similar ways on offense. Obviously, the quarterback situation is pretty comparable there, but you know, DJ Giddens is leading the Big 12 in rushing uh, at just over 600 yards, and Dylan Sampson is second in the SEC in rushing at 587. So both of these are teams that have really talented running backs, and a lot of their offensive dominance is coming by using the run game, and then it's just, hey, make the plays when we need you to make them for these quarterbacks. And over the last handful of games, Avery Johnson's been better about doing that. Now, People can say, hey, the BYU game was disastrous. That, that is true. It was not a, a good game um, for Avery Johnson. But, again, while he did have the, the two interceptions, there are also elements to that where his performance is skewed and, and dragged down a little bit because of all the mistakes that we talked about that got K-State in those holes and, and, and everything that went into that game. Um, but if you go and look at, at how things have played out, because I, I – I was kind of surprised by that, just based off the way that the national narrative seems to be about Nico Amaleava, probably just before this past week. I think it's it's obviously shifted. You lose at Arkansas, who people didn't really think was all that good. You don't play well. You make a really dumb play at the end of the game to end it. Very similar, honestly, to Avery's play at the end of the first half against Arizona. Um, I think it shifted a little bit, but if you go and look around, I mean, Avery in, in total QBR uh, is currently 31st in the country at 74.3. And then uh, Nico Iamaleava is at 54th at 64.1, uh, which I bring up the QBR to also show this and where the Avery stacks up compared to the rest of the Big 12 in QBR. This is kind of a wild list because I'm not sure anybody would have been able to tell you that those would be the top four players in quarterback rating. In the Big 12. And a reminder, this is ESPN's quarterback rating. This is different than a passer rating. QBR encapsulates much more of the total body of work for the quarterback as opposed to just whatever formula that passer rating, which is pretty much an archaic uh, way to do things. But there is uh, how the Big 12 looks in terms of QBR from the, the full-time starting quarterbacks right now. Obviously, Isaac Wilson is in there because Cam Rising has barely played, and who knows if he'll ever play another down of football or if he plays – tomorrow night in a scrimmage like who who knows with him um but what are your takeaways from how avery stacks up to the rest of the big 12 uh, again it's just that he he is doing fine and i and i think that 
what everybody needs to really realize is he's just a second year player, a true sophomore that's 19 years old. Like it, it was never going to be, he is lighting it up right away. And, and really you look at where he's stacking up in the rest of the big 12 with quarterbacks. He's been doing better than a lot of other quarterbacks that I think everybody had high hopes for. Like Noah Fafita hasn't been that great this year. Jalen Daniels has been more or less awful. And, and then you look at the rest of this list and, and you think that Avery's ceiling is probably higher than everybody on this list besides Shadur Sanders. Like, I think that everybody just needs the perspective of, okay, he's had six starts now at quarterback. You had this bye week after he was really started to get things rolling against Oklahoma State. Now this is where you would like to see you would like to see more of a push to continue to get better. And you look at his entire body of work so far this season, and he's gotten a little bit better every game outside of uh, before going from Arizona to BYU. Like that's the only real setback that he's had. So I think that he is on track to really put up the numbers that I think that we all kind of anticipated before the season of, the, the 35, 36, 37 total touchdowns uh, along with the rushing and the passing because you haven't even really brought up where he is rushing-wise. And Avery Johnson right now is tied with DJ Giddens for, I believe, the Big 12 lead and yards per carry. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think I have it uh, anymore, but a cup, uh, I guess last Sunday with Fan, I brought up the rushing leaders and that uh, going into last weekend, it's changed now, obviously, because other teams have played, but going into last weekend, Avery Johnson was 10th in the Big 12 in rushing yards, and, and K-State was the only school to have two teams or two players in the 16-team Big 12 in the top 10 of conference rushing. Uh, so there's an element there, and you can see that there's pretty defined kind of groupings here for these guys. I would say that, you know, you you would put the the top four, their number is all in there. Rocco Beck and Avery Johnson kind of in their own world. And then another little dump down and then uh, a hard drop from Sam Levitt to Jalen Daniels for that bottom group there uh, that has not been very good. And you look around, Donovan Smith got benched going into the TCU game. K.J. Jefferson has been awful. Isaac Wilson is not supposed to be the starting quarterback at Utah. Um, and, and then some of the others, like, I, you know, you can, you, we can discuss at length a lot of them in the situations that their schools are in at quarterback. But I found it fascinating. Um, it's also notable that K State isn't having to put as much on Avery Johnson as TCU, West Virginia, Cincinnati, and Baylor are on their quarterbacks right now. And to some extent, Iowa State as well, because Iowa State's run game is non-existent. Um, well, you, you also look at the quarterbacks that are in the top four. Two of them are on terrible teams. Yeah. like And they're constantly behind, so they are throwing and putting the ball into – or they're getting just more opportunities that way. Cincinnati's offense has been good. West Virginia's offense has been good. And then Iowa State just can't run the ball. So, I mean, that gives Rocco Beck more opportunities. It. I think that if you gave Avery Johnson more opportunities with K-State, like losing the way that Baylor and TCU have, like he would probably be up there in QBR and he's not that far away from Josh Hoover right now. Yeah. Um, if you, if you went and looked at how everything kind of worked out, um, uh, this is probably a good indicator of, of how good these quarterbacks have been this season in terms of leading the way. Um, Avery Johnson, Garrett Green, and Rocco Becht are all outside of the top 10 in total pass attempts this year in the Big 12. And yet you look and they are three of the top six QBR getters. So um, they're, they're, the way that their teams are set up, they're a little bit more complete. They're able to do some better things. I, like the completion for Iowa State would be is that their defense is pretty good. Um, then there's our good run game for West Virginia, part of that due to Garrett Green, the other part of that due to the running backs that they have there. Um, obviously, K-State has a great run game. But you look around at some of the others, like Josh Hoover, he leads the league in pass attempts at 236, so a lot of opportunities there. Uh, Alan Bowman and Shadur Sanders, who are on that first half, uh, they are third and fourth in attempts. And then Soresby is sixth. 
Um, and then some of the other guys that are way down there, like Fafita and Daniels that are struggling, they are uh, they are inside the top half of the league in terms of pass attempts as well. So there's there's volume that really decides this right here, where if you have a high volume and you're playing okay, you're going to probably have a better number because you're going to have the opportunity to make more plays there. And if you're not playing very well but you have a high number of attempts, your number is really going to take a significant hit, and that's what we're seeing mainly with Jalen Daniels and Noah Fafita. So I found it interesting to kind of compare the quarterbacks in the Big 12. Now, the last kind of comparison thing I want to do, and this isn't even necessarily comparing, but this is more of a hypothetical. And again, I my whole point with this is to, to tie a bow and try to explain, I don't think Avery Johnson is really any part of the problem. There are things that he needs to be better at and that he needs to do more of. But this has been a collection of I, I, people should not be jumping off the Avery Johnson wagon right now or doubting that it's going to get pieced together and look the way that you wanted it to as this thing moves forward. But I'll ask you this question, Drew. If knowing everything we know right now, going into the offseason last year, it was basically a foregone conclusion that, okay, Will Howard's going to get out of town. Avery Johnson's going to be the guy. Who would K-State be better off with at quarterback as we stand right now, Avery Johnson or Will Howard? Because I have a pretty easy answer to this question, um, but I'll, I'll get your take on it first and let people also know that like Will Howard is doing exactly what Ohio State wanted him to do and exactly what Will Howard thought he could do at Ohio State. I mean, he's played five games this year. Uh, he's thrown for over 1,200 yards, 12 touchdowns, three picks. He's 11th in the country in QBR at 84.2. Um, he's you know he, he's playing well. He's thrown for over 200 yards in every single game, and he now he has thrown a pick in his last three games, which is very Will Howard. Um, but given everything we know, who would you say if you were given the choice right now is the better pick for K State at quarterback? Who who gives them a better chance to win games? The answer to me is still Avery Johnson because the ceiling is just a lot higher, I think. I mean, in six games uh, where he started and I think now 13 or 12 total games, he's had five total touchdowns in two games. And that's just something that you didn't see from a K-State quarterback very often. I believe Will Howard only did it once. I think Skylar Thompson did it twice. And Avery Johnson's on it twice in his first two handfuls of games. So you think that the ceiling is probably a little bit higher, which the floor might be a little bit lower right now. But I think that as the season goes on and as he gets more reps, that the floor will even get higher than Will Howard's floor. So I think that you have to take that gamble. And it's tough because, I mean, you look at Oklahoma did it with Jackson Arnold and Dylan Gabriel and probably got burnt by it. Like they've already benched Jackson Arnold, uh, but they, they seem to be fine at quarterback now. But you really looked in the first three or four weeks of the season, they were kind of a train wreck at quarterback. So it's a gamble that I think a school probably has to make in this day and age. Yeah, and, and what I would say is, well, obviously for the long-term effects, it, it made a ton of sense to do this if you're K-State. But also given the type of team that you have, I think people should be very open to just saying like the Will Howard, Avery Johnson thing, it's worked out the best it could for both sides. Like K-State, the way they're constructed this year, they needed a quarterback like Avery Johnson that can make plays organically with his feet as opposed to Will Howard where like the best version of Will Howard, the reason that we saw that in 2022 is because that's the best group of receivers that K-State has had probably since 2014. Uh, and so he was able to play his style a little bit better. And then he also had a running back that could really help set it up. He had you know, an, an NFL tight end that he could trust to throw the ball to. Like The offense had the weapons that better fit for Will Howard. But K-State probably, I mean – they may still be four and one and sitting in this same spot, but there's also a real scenario that if Will Howard's the quarterback right now, they're, they're three and two or, you know, and things don't look as 
like they have as much potential packed into them because K State right now they the receivers are doing some things. Jace Brown and Keegan Johnson. I, that's been a topic of discussion on the the boards over at KSO. If you want to go check it out, but you look at those guys, they make up fifty percent of the yardage in K State's offense passing the ball uh, so far this season. So they're doing some things, but they're not the kind of threats that. Will Howard kind of needs and deserves given his skill set, which like that's the credit to what Malik Knowles did down the stretch run of his career, kind of where he started making those plays. Cade Warner, I mean, the the season Cade Warner had in 2022, like he was making plays. The options and the abilities were there. It's just missing from this roster. And Avery Johnson is the right and the best choice for what K-State can do. Um, so I just – I. I just wanted to to discuss this today because, like I said, my perception is there are a lot more people that have kind of soured on their opinion, both those inside the K-State fan base that are close to it and then also those on the outside that are going to think that K-State just got their ass kicked against BYU and, oh, Avery can't throw the ball, he can't do this or whatever. Meanwhile, everybody's darling until he went on the road and lost to Arkansas who I don't like I don't think that's a tougher place to play than BYU and I don't think that's a better team than BYU. Uh I mean it, people would have told you easily that Nico Iamaleava was the better choice than Avery Johnson the better player this season. The numbers just don't bear that out and the field doesn't bear it out. So just wanted to put that out there. Now, with all that said, there are 5 games in the books, 7 left in the regular season. K-State has a big one this weekend against Colorado where Colorado's defense isn't necessarily the most concerning thing, but it's having to go match for match with the Colorado offense against the K-State defense. It's been shaky. So this is a big Avery Johnson game because he's got to handle going on the road again, late night kick, all this stuff, and being up to the task because his defense may not be able to perform as well as they did to start that BYU game. So how do you evaluate what Avery Johnson did through the first five games and what's the expectation for what comes next, starting with Colorado this weekend? I think through the first five, like I've said, I think that he's been fine. I think that there's been some growing pains and some some throws that really make you kind of question what he was seeing or even some throws that it's like, holy crap, you really made that one. So you want to get that more consistency down in these next seven starting with Saturday in Colorado. Uh, but there's been more good than bad. And I think that that's kind of what the perspective really needs to be is that he has done a lot more good than bad and he's not always putting the ball in harm's way. It's just when the interceptions have happened, the interceptions have been kind of ugly but I, I think that he has been good. And really f- the next step that I think that he needs to take is to really learn what he's learned from these first five games and be like, okay, I know that I probably can't make that throw. Or maybe there's a time where I need to sit in the pocket more. And you saw that against Oklahoma State where he really sat in the pocket and then rolled out and then hit Garrett Oakley for that, for that touchdown to make it 14 to 13, where that was a throw that he didn't even make he didn't even attempt to make against BYU. So I think the constant growth is what you're going to see. And, and I'll, I'll go ahead and say right now that I think that there will be another five total touchdown game for Avery Johnson sometime this season. Do you think it's this weekend against Colorado? Cause that would be kind of nice for K state. <laughs> this would be the time to do it, but I, I'm not going to put a date on it. I'll just say that there will be a game where he has five total touchdowns again. Okay. I hear, I hear five. Can I get a six? I'm not going to go six. That That's a lot. Uh, that, that, that's a lot. lot when DJ Giddens can also do the same thing. Yeah. I, I just think that it, this is such a crucial weekend for him because it's clear that when things started to snowball, and again, I, I don't think it's fully his fault, but he's the quarterback. He kind of has to wear this. When things started to snowball, he certainly wasn't a part of the solution and the fix in Provo. He, he contributed to – the spiral that came after the Giddens fumble. And then he threw a pick of his own. And then, you know, he had another one and it just kind of, I mean, DJ Giddens fumble was what started the avalanche, but you know, it was maybe it wasn't even like an avalanche. Maybe the best thing to do would be like DJ Giddens started the like brush fire. And then it was like, okay, we're gonna get the fire department in there to kind of get this thing out. And right as you think, okay, 
it seems under control. Avery Johnson was like, yeah, heck yeah, we did it, boys. And he took his cigarette out of his mouth and he threw it right back into the to the dry grass and it caught the field on fire again. You're like, oh no, what did you do? Uh, and then he came along, you know, another drive later and he just was like, oh, this can of gasoline, let's toss that in there too. And it, you're like, holy crap, what's going on here? Uh, and, and I think that the good thing and the, the maturity of Avery is that like he owned up to after the DJ fumble that he really started to press. And I think that that's something that you saw again against Oklahoma State where he could have done the same thing and pulled it yep. again, but instead he responded and hit Garrett Oakley for a touchdown. And then it was like the, it was like that was like the, the weight of the world coming off of his shoulders. And then it really opened up the rest of the way. Yeah, no, I, uh, I, I that's what I was going to bring up next is that you, you have the bad showing to go off of against BYU when things started to go wrong. But then against Oklahoma State, same type of deal where you go and, and look at how things went. K-State feels in control of that game and like, you know, things are going to be okay. Oklahoma State, after the offense kind of stalls, Ghost takes the lead in the very first play after a touchdown. You throw an interception at the 33-yard line and the defense is able to hold them to a field goal. And then that's when K-State came back and answered immediately where they uh, are able to go and and score in just a couple of plays and uh, make it pretty easy. So I, I think that's – you saw him bounce back. The only difference would be it's a little bit easier to do that in the home environment, which he did, as opposed to the road environment. And obviously we know how crazy Colorado fans can be, uh, as we've seen over the last couple of days. Uh, Avery Johnson and the Cats are going to get to experience that this weekend for the first time. And again, in a, one of those really tough time windows where – they're kicking off well after nine o'clock uh, in in your your local area, and you're on the road. You're sitting in a hotel room all day, just foreign landscape. Like it, it can throw you off, and that's that sounds silly, I'm sure, to some to say. But do you know how many different people I heard on Monday making the suggestion that the Pittsburgh Steelers were worse off on Saturday or on Sunday night because of the weather delay? Because well. The game ended at 1 a.m. their time. It was only midnight for the Cowboys players. And, like, yes, I mean, I, once you're playing, I don't know that that impacts you that much. Um, but the weight and everything that goes with it and getting started, I think that's the difficult part about that. Uh, and then just finding yourself in a place you're not accustomed to. So I think it'll be interesting for K-State this weekend. I think Avery Johnson's fine, but uh, I think going out and having a strong performance and securing a win in Boulder – does a lot to boost where this team is and what the perception of them is. Uh, and I think that this is a game that he's going to have to go out and help this team win. Cause to be honest right now, I'm not very confident in K state's defense being able to stop Colorado's offense. So I think that this is going to be a heavy back and forth type situation. And this game is going to come down to Avery Johnson has to be better than Shadur Sanders, not in overall numbers per se, but at least in terms of what you've done for your team to make more winning plays when the ball's in your hands than you did losing plays. And both Avery Johnson and Shadur Sanders at times have shown the ability to make both the winning and the losing play for their team. Whoever does the winning side of it better, uh, they're going to come out on top because I, I don't know that this is a great defensive game coming up this weekend. So. It'll be interesting to see. Uh, any other thoughts on Avery Johnson and K-State's situation at quarterback right now? Uh, I think that it, it'll be a fun matchup because it's two really good quarterbacks. And, and I just think – I think that you might not see a lot of the passing yards that are kind of eye-popping on Saturday from Avery, but this feels like a game where he could be able to run the ball really well. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, and we talked about this. Was it Sunday that we talked about uh, the Colorado's quarterback run defense situation? Um, and if you go and look at the numbers and, and the games that they've played against quarterbacks that have that skill set, um, they've they've given up 80 yards to the North Dakota State quarterback and then 77 yards, I think is what it was, uh, to K.J. Jefferson at UCF and then the others we talked about. Uh, Dylan Rayola is not a runner, as we saw in that game against Illinois. Uh, the only place he's running is backwards. Uh, and then uh, we know that Colorado State doesn't have a quarterback. So it's, it is what it is there. 
Um, but yeah, his legs will certainly be a part of this. And we've seen that take a little bit of an uptick recently. Uh, he had a hundred yards rushing against Arizona, a team that's been bad against the quarterback run um, against BYU that they didn't use it early, but then they went to it and it worked. Um, but at that point it, it was really a moot point. And then you look at what he did against Oklahoma state. He only had five carries, 60 yards, two touchdowns. He also had a, a carry that was a touchdown that got wiped off um, because of a penalty. You know, what else? It's K-State football this season, so they're going to do something stupid uh, to erase a good play. So uh, the quarterback run game will be a big deal, and this also kind of feels like one of those games where everybody's kind of clamored for more Avery, DJ, and Dylan on the field at the same time. This kind of feels like the perfect game for it, coming off of a bye week and also Dylan Edwards' revenge game on the road in Boulder. So – I expect to see uh, a good number of times where those guys are out there trying to make an impact with all three of them. So it'll be fun to follow along with, and we will have full coverage of that this weekend from Boulder. As we uh, hit the road Friday afternoon, we'll be making a pit stop in Goodland to see Lincoln Cure, the five-star tight end commit for the Cats, and we'll have full coverage of that uh, up sometime Friday night, early Saturday morning, where we'll have highlights. We'll talk to Lincoln, get a bunch of different stuff from that and uh, see where everything is is going with his recruitment as Oregon still tries to weasel their way uh, back into things there, and then we'll be off to Boulder and ready to go there. So that is the, the look ahead, and we'll talk about our Lincoln Cure visit coming up uh, tomorrow on the recruiting update. Drew has a couple of other things to get to as well, so we'll get that all covered and uh, keep everybody in the know with K-State football recruiting tomorrow on the KSO Show. So for Drew Galloway, I'm Mason Vo. Thanks for watching and listening to K-State Online. You can find more of our Cats coverage over at On3. Just go find kstateonline.com.